Oh yes, great, 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 great. Oh, we've suddenly gone to uh, the second um, slide anyway. Uh, so lots of people have enjoyed playing chess and included in including them, in, sorry, included within them are people like Napoleon, Paul Robeson, Henry VIII, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Charles I, uh, and so on, Karl Marx. Uh, these are all people who are recorded as having enjoyed playing chess. And you can see also Queen Victoria, uh, uh, Marshal Tito, um, uh, Henry V, and so on. So there are a large number of people who, it is claimed, enjoyed playing chess. Ah, now I... I'm, ah. Oh, it's a bit slow on responding, but okay. Um, I'll have to be aware of that. Here are some more people who enjoyed playing chess, including Marlena Dietrich uh, and uh, one of the popes and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Rembrandt, you've, uh, you've got a whole load of people who enjoyed playing chess. Hmm. I wonder whether there's something else I need to do rather than carriage return. Ah, here we go. Ah, so it's actually, it's press, uh, I need to press the uh, mouse in order to advance. And here we have some more people, including Tsar Nicholas II, uh, uh, George III, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, whose name I've just forgotten, uh, Che Guevara uh, from Cuba. He was absolutely addicted to chess. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Verdi, and so on. A lot of people, famous people, have enjoyed playing chess. But there are some people who did not enjoy chess, including uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, who uh, uh, was opposed to the playing of chess in Iran when he was in charge. Albert Einstein, who found it too difficult uh, and gave up on chess. Um, uh, then you have things like uh, West Point Military Academy banned cadets from playing chess, uh, probably because it was wasting their time. George Bernard Shaw famously said chess is a foolish expedient for making idle people believe they're doing something clever when in fact they're wasting their time. Joseph Stalin, who even though at one stage it was claimed he played chess, uh, when it in power, in fact, he clearly disliked it and had the minister responsible for developing chess in the Soviet Union executed during the purge. And then you have this famous quote, uh, from uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Anderley, Amberley excelled in chess, one Mark Watson of a scheming mind. Uh, so not everybody loved chess. There is one rare Mulready advertising envelope which mentions chess. There were loads and loads of Mulready uh, advertising envelopes, but this one uh, printed or published by William Hallett of High Holborn uh, in August 1840 had uh, he made a series of advertising Mulready's and this particular one only had about 10 items still in existence and it advertises chess sets and ha uh, Hallett was in fact uh, a wood turner and he was advertising some of his uh, product, including uh, chess sets. Uh, uh, his particular chess set sell at auction for thousand pounds or so. And this particular item uh, it, it was sent from Ride, Isle of Wight, to the editor of the Globe Strand, uh, arriving one day later from its postmark, something rather unusual. And here, in fact, is the advert. And you can see uh, under pastimes and amusements, 
uh, ivory chess men uh, uh, in various types. Uh, and this is the only one of the Harrell advertising Malwadis which mentions um, chess sets. So this is uh, really quite rare. I've got one of the few items uh, with this advert. Then we move on to manufacture of chess boards. And this is the earliest chess related postmark in the world, 1923. Uh, and it was promoting the local industries of Borstendorf in Germany. Uh, and it mentions the fact that uh, this town is famous for its chessboard industry. And the top special postmark was used between 1923 and 1929, and indeed is the earliest postmark anywhere in the world relevant to chess. Um, examples from 1923 are very rare. Uh, the lower postmark, uh, here uh, was used a bit later on uh, in, in between 1938 and 1941 and indeed similar postmarks continue to be used for many years. Significantly 1923 was the year of massive German inflation and here we have a couple of examples of the same postmark uh, for B Borstendorf uh, uh, which uh, shows values up to 800 marks, still not up to the many millions of marks that could uh, be, or which were reached later on in 1923. Um, needless to say, I'm looking for examples of really high inflation covers from the 1923 postmark, but uh, I've been unable to find any. Okay, here we have a German Berlin pre-printed postcard for local use, uh, including an advert for Max Sanger of Friedrich Strasse, who sold pipes, cigarette holders, tobacco, walking sticks, cufflinks, as well as dominoes and chess and draft set. The front of the card tells uh, users to only put the card into red post boxes and warns that imitations are forbidden. I have no idea what the significance of the red post, uh, um, po post boxes are. If somebody knows, I would be very interested to hear about. Okay, here's another example of uh, adverts promoting chess sets and chess boards. Uh, uh, this particular one is uh, 1858 prepaid envelope sent to a Bath address. Uh, this is a British cover, and the adverts on the back include one for chess boards and other chess men. So these are not unknown, though they're quite unusual. Okay, chess clubs. Uh, here is uh, a pre stamped. Uh, Capony postcard with an 1890 po uh, postmark from Cosmopolitan Chess Club asking a Mr. Fagel uh, if he could play in a match against City Chess Rooms Club. Mr. Fagel did not reply, so presumably didn't uh, uh, play in that match. Uh, I've been unable to find anything about Cosmopolitan Chess Club or Mr. Fagel or City Chess Rooms Club. Uh, so I can tell you nothing more about this particular item. Here's another chess club. Uh, this club was indeed active between 1890 and 1939. Pre-printed postcard informs a member of the club who's due to play in one of the club's championship, or at least it's not been filled out, but uh, it, it, this will be uh, an invitation to play in one of the uh, championships. Okay, I've got such cards 
from various countries. Here's one from Hawaii of all places. It's a postal stationery card reminding a member of the so-called Steinitz Chess Club. Steinitz was world champion at the time, world chess champion. Uh, so the club was named after him uh, to pay their dues, to renew their subscription. Uh, and uh, this uh, particular club didn't in fact last long. And so it could well be that this particular individual did not renew their prescri uh, subscription. His Nor New Orleans Chess, Checkers and Whisk Club, uh, founded in 1880, uh, membership increased rapidly, had reached in 1881, 150, moved to bigger quarters in 1883, uh, and a uh, famous player, George McKenzie, visited the club, gave a series of ex exhibition chess uh, games, uh, and thereafter many other famous chess players visited and played exhibition games against club members. And this included world champion Steinitz, world champion Lasker, and Paul Murphy, famous American player, lived in Orleans, New Orleans and was a regular member of the club. Uh, a marble bust of him still occupies a prominent position in its current room. Uh, this letter would be addressed to Portland, Oregon, but I don't know what the contents are. Um, so it, it's uh, yeah, unknown details. Here's some one from uh, Argentina. It's uh, uh, the Buenos Aires uh, Chess Club, Club de Adjadrez, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, and once again, this is an example of a letter which has been sent from the club, but I don't have the contents. The, the Metropolitan Chess Club uh, was founded in 1890 in the UK and is probably the second oldest chess club in the UK after Edinburgh. Um, which was founded in 1822. Uh, to get members to play in matches, they sent reply paid cards uh, uh, informing the individual uh, th that they were invited to play. Uh, and this example, both halves that are attached, was sent and replied to in 1894. Hong Kong Chess Club also had its own stationery, its postcard uh, addressed to Shanghai, uh, inviting the recipient to participate in the final round of the club's knockout competition later that month. And here's one from Boston, USA, founded in 1845, uh, closed some years later, and this particular postal stationery and card invite members to meet Emmanuel Lasker, then the world champion, and who at that time lived in the USA. This uh, particular postal stationery card was issued by the executive committee of Augsburg Chess Club Bavaria, founded in 1873. Uh, this particular card, dated 1901, reminds gentlemen and it seemed to be only gentlemen taking part in a tournament uh, to turn up at least a week between, uh, uh, sorry, at least once a week between Tuesday and Friday for a tournament game so the tournament can be completed in time. Uh, so uh, both cards uh, at the stated time uh, had imprints uh, on the reverse, indicating that if you failed to turn up, you would be defaulted. Uh, the 1901 card also has a Bavarian royal family uh, crest. And here's some more. Uh, again, the bane of all chess clubs is uh, getting people to play their part in matches. Uh, and this particular one says, you must complete your club championship game. Uh, it, but this is uh, unused, so wasn't sent out. And this is Vienna Chess Club, founded in 1860, 1857, 
and its 1908 prepaid postal stationery card is an invitation to attend the extraordinary general meeting on 12th of March. And the only item on the agenda was to uh, approve a new honorary membership. Bangkok Chess Club, uh, this is inviting a member again to an extraordinary general meeting to discuss a new venue. Uh, I don't know when this club was founded or was closed, but it reopened in 1999 uh, and is apparently extremely successful at the moment. This is an unusual chess club. Uh, the postmark is Mocha FT, uh, EFTI. Uh, and this was a Berlin establishment, uh, and it was a notable uh, uh, building uh, opened as a cafe, dance house with a restaurant, ha hairdressing saloon, billiard sa salon, shorthand service, and a chess club, uh, which was run by a strong chess master. Chess would have been very difficult with the noise of the establishment. Uh, and Mocha refers to the coffee served, while FT uh, was named after the owner. Uh, the, the establishment closed in 1930 due to the economic depression. But between 1929 and 1930, it had its own postmark and uh, its, its own uh, post box as shown here. And then we've got uh, some postmarks celebrating chess clubs, uh, the 2008 ones celebrating the foundation of Timo Saria in Romania chess club. Uh, this is a very successful club. And in the 1933 uh, postmark from Germany, uh, it's a slogan saying, uh, come and visit your local chess club. Uh, uh, and it, it says they'll be open 22nd, 24th, and 28th of May. That's not such an uncommon postmark. Okay, here's a chess game that never took place, even though it says it did. Um, this is from the American Civil War, and there were a large number of patriotic covers which were produced used by supporters of the Union side and indeed uh, from the rebel side as well. But this is a particular Union uh, uh, cover and there are two versions of it, which you can see here. And it shows an imaginary chess game played between General Winfield Scott, the commander in chief of the Union forces uh, and uh, the uh, rather unhappy looking uh, Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Confederate States. And it has uh, the lower cover has uh, 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 some text uh, basically saying that Winfield Scott is thrashing Jefferson Davis. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, uh, Winfield Scott was dismissed after just a few months as commander in chief of the Union forces. So we can confidently date these covers uh, from the very early beginning of the Civil War. Uh, I can't imagine these covers were used after that. Uh, it, Scott was basically dismissed uh, for incompetence. So that's a chess game that never took place. And here's a fake chess tournament from the USA, or what I suspect is a fake, fake tournament. This was uh, the Trabui uh, tournament set up by a gentleman called Isaac Trabui. He was a lawyer and a chess fanatic, and he promoted what he hoped would be an annual series of chess congresses uh, to be held in a city named after him, Trabui City, it's now called Punta Garda in Florida. So entry was open to anybody except lawyers, uh, which is a bit of a clue that perhaps this was rather dodgy. Um, prizes were plots of land, which uh, Trabui had bought in speculation. 
but they turned out to be swamps, uh, but they could be used in Trapu's view to grow pineapples. No such Congress was held. And uh, I have read articles saying whether, uh, or arguing whether Trabui was a con man or just incompetent. Uh, but anyway, here's the cover, uh, uh, postmark Louise, Louisville, where Tra Trabou lived. Uh, and the earliest known postmark, oh, sorry, earliest known cover to promote a chess congress. Uh, so the letter itself is addressed to the Florida land agent. So maybe his intentions might have been honest, but the fact that he didn't want lawyers to participate in, in his proposed uh, 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 chess congress makes me doubt it. I think he was a con. Um... Okay, I now move on to correspondence chess, uh, which is chess carried out by means of letters, postcards, and so on. And this is one of the earliest items I've come across. It's an unstamped entire from 17th of July, I think 1842, uh, addressed to uh, an MP and junior minister. Uh, uh, the, the particular individual helped found the University of London. Um, the letter is from Lord Althorpe, from whom Princess Diana was descended and who was active in postal reform in the 1830 to 1834 is, uh, period uh, and was deemed to be uh, uh, prominent in the famous Reform Act of 1832. And the letter simply says, Queen tonight's fourth square. And I've got to say, neither of these individuals uh, was a noted chess player, but this is undoubtedly a chess game being played by correspondent. Then we get correspondence chess cards, and I've got a very large collection of these. Uh, uh, one example is I've got a collection of 10 postcards uh, sent by an unknown person to John Amphlett. Uh, I've got Amphlett's details. Uh, he was uh, the squire of Clent, whatever that means. The postcards are dated 1873 to 1875. They're in shorthand, uh, but they all have uh, a chess moves like here at the top, queen to queen three. So there clearly was an ongoing chess game. And then I've got correspondence chess cards from all sorts of countries. Uh, this one is uh, between Russia and Netherlands, even though it's written in German. And here you can see uh, some chess moves in it. And here's one between Russia and England. Uh, and this is 1890. And once again, you've got uh, a clear indication of chess moves. Uh, one between Germany and Russia, again, your clear indication, there are two games running simultaneously in this particular case. Uh, this is 1891. Uh, here we've got one from South Africa, 1896, again with chess moves recorded uh, for two games. Uh, uh, here you've got pre-printed cards uh, where you can already, uh, uh, on the back of the card, uh, allow for the sender to fill in the moves for game one and game two from Augsburg Chess Club. Here's one from between Egypt and Germany. Once again, we've got uh, chess moves uh, uh, recorded. Here we've got one from uh, Russia, USSR, uh, already with pre-printed uh, uh, chessboard plus possible moves uh, and this particular one uh, was uh, sent in 1974 uh, and uh, the uh, winner, uh, uh, sorry, the postmark commemorates uh, a, a chess championship match uh, which had been won by Anatoly Karpov. 
Then you've got artificial compositions. Uh, here we've got a postcard, uh, which is a reply, reply paid postcard uh, from Bavaria to Bern, Switzerland, in which a chess position is described and the recipient is invited to, have, to work out how white can mate black in five moves. The reply back was never used, so presumably the recipient couldn't work out the solution. But these chess competitions are very common, artificially set up positions where somebody, the uh, reader, is invited to try and solve the problem. To finish off this talk, uh, I want to talk about, or oh, this is very nearly finishing off the talk, uh, chess and war. Uh, and this is a 1939 Feldpost packet, German packet, containing a pocket chess set. So this is intended for use by a soldier on uh, in action uh, to set up a position and to send his, I presume it'll be a his, moves. Uh, this is, of course, one, this particular one has not been used. It's an unused example. Here's another one, 1941 German Feldpost package produced by the Diana Games Company of Frankfurt and Main in Germany for our soldiers. Three well-loved games, chess, draft, and nine men's Morris. And the pack includes once again portable board pieces, but for all three games and instructions how to play the games. And once again, this is mint, hasn't been used. Here we've got impact of uh, the of war, in this case, on correspondence chess. Is a 1940 letter from Germany opened by the German censors and returned to the, uh, to the sender because the letter contained materials contrary to a German law, 2nd of April, 1940, and the enclosed leaflet lists those items which must not be sent, including illegible materials, anything in Hebrew or Jewish language, and number four, ticked in pencil by the censor, picture postcards, photographs, braille material, chess games, crosswords or other puzzles. Uh, the other, the uh, cover also has an additional stamp stating that send a, sending picture postcards abroad is forbidden. So it's possible that his envelope included a picture postcard and or a chess game going on. And they were clearly worried that uh, uh, the nomenclature of correspondence chess might be used to cover some sort of espionage materials. And here we have another example for World War II, uh, a second type of notification for returning the item to the sender. And oh, once again, it actually specifically says the reason for the return is uh, uh, the presence of chess problems. And finally, a very rare autograph of perhaps the most famous former world chess champion, uh, Bobby Fischer from the USA. Uh, he very, very rarely autographed anything. And the, this particular item is from 1959 candidates tournament, that is to say a chess tournament, where he came fifth and it's got a special postmark. It's got a special envelope for it, but also he has signed it. And I think I've only got two examples of his signature. He really was very, very sparing in his use of uh, his autograph for any purpose whatsoever. So that basically concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, how long have we gone on for? About 35 minutes. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, from the audience.